first version, let's stand and worship together. I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. Satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Your voice to sing. Oh, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you see them all, and you still call me free. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing.
Hey everyone, my name is Tyler and I want to welcome you to First Ridgeland's Worship Online. No matter where you are right now, and even if this is your first time or you've got an entire watch party going on with you right now, we want you to know something. You belong here. And if you want to know more about First Ridgeland, simply text First Ridgeland to 95577. We are so glad you're here. Before we continue with worship, I want to make sure we're all in the know. First, get ready for First Wednesdays happening this Wednesday at 6 p.m. College students are invited for an in-person worship experience on campus while the entire congregation will join via live stream. You truly don't want to miss this time of worship and prayer, and be sure to invite a friend. For more information on First Wednesdays, just go to firstridgeland.org slash firstwednesdays. Next, save the date for First Ridgeland's Turkey Bowl. On November 14th, we'll head to Freedom Ridge Park for a day of food trucks, friends, and flag football. This is a great opportunity to invite your life group, coworkers, and neighbors to spend a Saturday and do real life together in fall's truest form, tailgating and football. For more information and to sign up today, go to firstridgeland.org slash turkey bowl. Last but not least, parents, you and your children are invited to participate in family commissioning. By being a part of family commissioning, you're committing before the church to strive to become more like Jesus and to do your best to raise your children in a way that points them to God. And we want to partner with you and your family through this journey. If you'd like to participate in family commissioning on November 15th, simply go to firstridgeland.org FC. Now, let's get back to worship. Jesus breaks every chain and salvation is in his name. Let's lift our voices and praise him.
church has committed to memorizing one new verse every week because we believe His Word is the big way we can become more like Jesus. It changes how we think and how we act towards others. Let's read the week's verse together. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. That is a really, really big promise. We change every day and the world around us does too, but not Jesus. He never changes. Trust in Him today and rest in His love, mercy, and forgiveness. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day, and please help us have a really good week this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God, you never lost a battle, and you never will. Miracles when you move, such an easy thing for you to do. In your hand, it's moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus. And your voice is calling me out And right now I know you're able And my God come through again You can do all things Yes, you can You can do all things but fail you never lost a battle no you never lost a battle and i know i know you never will thank you jesus oh what a yeah everything's possible by the power of the holy ghost a new wind is blowing right now Breaking my heart of stone Taking over like this Jericho And my walls, they're all crashing down And right now, I know you're able And my God comes through again
Hey, good morning, friends. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today via live stream. We are delighted that you have tuned in. And as always, we want to ask you to do us a favor and connect with us. And we want to ask you to do that by sharing with us maybe where you're worshiping from and your prayer requests, your praises, any comments that you have for us. We would love to hear from you. And I want to encourage you today, share the worship service on your social media page. We greatly appreciate you doing that. And listen, we're going to land the plane today with our series, Failing Faith. Failing Faith. What we think about God just simply does not fit with the real world. Namely, that spiritual blessing equals physical happiness. Or stated another way, God's will equals our comfort. However, nothing could be further from the truth. Scripture disproves that myth. We need only experience one loss in life, the death of a loved one, a divorce, or a relationship that comes to an end, or a job loss, to feel like our faith is a fraud. And this series is designed to introduce us to a faith that will withstand the inevitable trials of life, yes, even, even a pandemic. And I want you to remember that God's much more concerned about developing our character than he is our comfort. The main idea today will help. With God, there is always more to the story. With God, there is always more to the story. There are going to be some things this side of heaven where he's not going to reveal everything to us, especially as we're walking through the trial. You know, I've known many families through the years that have walked down the road of, of a health crisis, um, specifically parents, parents of kids, of small children. And I've watched as they've navigated this numerous families through 30 years of ministry. And not one of them ever asked me, why me or why us? But they always ask this question. Help us know, what is God teaching us right now? What's the purpose of us going through this? And I see it over and over again. Once they come through the crisis, the health crisis, invariably God brings another family into their lives who's facing a similar health issue. And God uses them to help that, that other family navigate that incredibly difficult road. Hey, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3, and 4 lived out. That we comfort other people with the comfort that God has first given us. You know, with God, there's always, there is always more to the story. And I think sometimes we want a manuscript and God's given us just kind of a, a skeleton outline. And that's what happened in John chapter 11, our focal text today, when Jesus would raise Lazarus from the dead. You know, I've read this story countless times. I've taught from this text. I've preached from this text. But this time, God showed me even more new truths. So what I want to focus on it's what happened before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. We're going to look at John 1, pardon me, John 11, 1 through 7, and then we're going to look at verse 14, and then we're going to fill in the, the, the gaps as we go. First, verse 1. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick, and he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair, one of probably the most beautiful expressions of worship the New Testament records. Verse 3, and so the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now please note, they had a problem and they viewed Jesus as the solution. They had a problem, their brother was sick, Lazarus, and they contacted Jesus. He was just a couple of miles away. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now that's perhaps the summation verse of the entire story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. But notice this little caveat. I've missed this before. Notice what John said in verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So John prefaces with that, and then he shares with us a confusing verse. 
So when he heard, he meaning Jesus, heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. And then between the time that he waited and the time that they were going to go, notice what happened. Verse 14. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Jesus' delay resulted in Lazarus' death. How can we make sense of that? Well, we will with three truths today. Here's the first. We don't have to know what's right. We don't have to know what's next, rather, to do what's right. We don't have to know what's next to do what's right. You know, the text says that Martha had a conversation with Jesus when he finally did, um, when he finally arrived. And when I saw this, I thought, I've missed this over and over. I've missed it over and over. Because initially she said, had you been here, our brother would be alive. And then she followed that statement up by saying this, but we know even now, but we know even now, God will give you what you asked for. That was a drop the mic moment for me. That was a declaration of faith. And she would go on in the later verses to say, Lord, we, we know that you are Lord. We know that you can raise him from the dead. We don't have to know what's next to do what's right. Listen, Martha's declaration in verse 22 is the very definition of Hebrews 11.1 1 that we use in our Bibles as the faith verse. Now, faith is confidence. Confidence in what we hope for and assurance, assurance about what we do not see. You know, we don't always see life as God sees it. As a matter of fact, we simply see the play right in front of us. But God sees the whole playing field, doesn't he? You know, when you're watching a football game and there's kind of a boring play call where the running back runs between tackles and all the big offensive and defensive linemen are piled up in a pile and the referee blows the whistle and he's trying to break the pile up and get the ball and spot the ball. That's basically what I see every day and what you see. We see the play that's right in front of us, not God. He sees our lives from beginning to end. He sees what we're going to do. He knows the thought and the motive behind our actions. And we don't have to know what's next. In other words, we don't have to have a manuscript. We don't have to know what's next to do the next right thing. You've heard me talk in the past of one of my neighbors, Will, we're incredibly close, and um, we both navigated lots of challenges together through the years and watched lots of ball games and shared lawn secrets. But we've also been had to um, deal with a lot of drainage issues because of where our homes are located in our neighborhood. And I feel like we've done a pretty good job of that. And this past year, um, Will had a lot of work done. And it all, all the water was going into a massive drain that was pretty deep and he had some work done. He wasn't pleased with it. The first big rain washed it all the work away, stopped the drain up. The yard flooded. It was just a, a kind of a it was just a horrible situation to see over and over again. He says, "Well, you know what? I'm just going to fix it myself. I know how to do this." And so he did. And it was about a three foot deep um, ravine, the drain at the bottom, and he had Bermuda sod all the way around. It looked golf course perfect. It really did. And then that next week, somebody had come do some, did some work on his yard. And when um, I got home that evening, he was standing by his drain like this and just scratching his head. The person that did the work for him inadvertently drove uh, one of their pieces of equipment through his work and it rutted everything out. It looked like, a, it looked like a, a teenager had driven their car through his yard. I mean, it was bad. And I said, well, just call the guy. I know the guy. I'll call him for you. He'll, he'll make this right. And he's like, no, I, 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 let me just think about this. And I said, well, if you, try, if you decide to tackle it yourself, I'll help you. I'll help you. He goes, no, 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 I, I'll figure it out. Well, the next day I get home from work, he's fixed it. He's got all the equipment out there. And, it, I mean, again, it looks golf course ready. And he called me over there. and I, I admired his work. And here's what he said to me. He says, you know, God taught me a lesson right here. And here's the lesson. God wanted to know 
if I was going to react emotionally or if I was going to do the right thing in the eyes of God. And the right thing in the eyes of God is Ephesians 5.10. Find out what pleases the Lord. And an emotional reaction never pleases the Lord. But acting in humble obedience does. What are you going through right now? Be honest with yourself. Is it a financial issue? Is it a job issue? A marital issue? Or is it a parenting problem you're having with your kids? Let me encourage you in something right now. You don't have to know you don't have to know the whole picture to do the next right thing. Many people find themselves in a bind because they make one bad decision. And then that one bad, bad decision morphs into more bad decisions. Let me just blow a whistle, call a flag, or throw a flag right now and say, Stop! If you, if you find yourself in a situation right now, maybe it's a marital problem or a work problem or a friendship problem or an academic problem, you fill in the blank. And you've made a poor choice. Don't compound that one poor choice with more bad choices, but rather resolve at that moment, I'm going to do the next right thing. Because we don't have to know what's next to do what's next. And here's, what you, here's what's next. Obey God. Trust Him. Make decisions in your marriage. Make decisions in your friendship and at work that will honor God. That's how you gain traction in your faith. You do the next right thing in the eyes of God. So truth number one, we don't have to know what's next to do the next right thing in the eyes of God. You have to trust him and you humbly obey him. Okay, truth number two, no pain can escape his embrace, the embrace of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's fill in the gaps a little bit in the story. In verse 14, Jesus tells the disciples plainly, Lazarus is dead. They go and they, they see all the family, Mary and Martha, and they're all grieving. People are weeping and there's tears and there's hurt. And it's a tough situation. Jesus has the conversation with Martha and she says, Lord, if you had been here, you know, he wouldn't have died. I believe now even God will give you what you asked for. I believe even now God's going to give you what you asked for. And they go through that conversation, and she declares her, her, her faith in Christ. And, and then the Bible says something interesting in verse 35. Shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And then in verse 36, it says this. See how he loved him. See how he loved him. He, he's weeping with us. He's grieving with us. So please note, before Jesus solved their problem, he felt their pain by grieving with them. Before he solved their problem, he felt their pain pain. Did you know, regardless of what you're going through right now, you will never, ever hurt without him. He actively hurts with us. He actively comforts us. And I know, because I've been there, I have felt at times, God, are you here? I feel like I'm hurting all by myself here. God never once, not one time in scripture, does it ever say that he will leave you just because we walk away from God does not mean that God walks away from us. No pain that we're going through, no marital pain, no financial pain, no uh, vocational pain, friendship pain, academic pain, will escape the embrace of a sovereign God. And he doesn't just sympathize on our behalf. He acts on our behalf. And then our job step, we have to, we have to assume responsibility. We have to live as if we know he sees the whole picture that he sees our life from beginning to end because he does and because he's God. He hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't given up on you. He hasn't thrown, it, thrown in the towel and <sighs> sighed and says, golly, why are they doing that again? Why don't they wake up? No pain can escape the embrace of a loving, comforting Savior named Jesus. You know, back in the olden days, I mean the real olden days, when we could still like 
throw down and have a huge, huge wedding with no worries of social distancing and having to wear a mask. And back in the days when we could still have a big celebration of life service here and celebrate the passing of one of our, our members. Um, I remember a celebration of life service here just this past February and past November. And I remember this, that this room was filled with people who were providing comfort for one of our families who had lost a loved one. And I, uncharacteristically, I stayed the whole wake, the whole visitation I was here. And we were getting ready to wrap things up, and I noticed that someone came in late. And they were making their way down to, to see the family. The family was um, standing in front of the stage, and they were receiving friends as they came to pay their respects. But whenever I saw my buddy, our church member, catch eyes with his buddy, a family friend of 40 plus years, his chin began to quiver. And he caught their eye. And then they finally saw one another, and I'm thinking, well, I wonder what they'll say. And they didn't say a word, they didn't speak one word. They just embraced with a hug. And my friend, our church member, buried his face in his buddy's shoulder and he wept. And as I sat and I watched that, I thought to myself, that must, that must, be, that must be what it feels like to be embraced by a comforting and loving and accepting Savior named Jesus Christ. You know, I'm not sure where you may be today. I just want you to hear me say that no pain can escape His embrace. Regardless of what you're going through right now, maybe you've let yourself down. Maybe you've just fumbled the ball out of the back of the end zone, and you're like, why did I do that? He is still waiting on you. Maybe you've run away from God. He hasn't run away from you. No pain can escape his embrace. Before Jesus would ever raise Lazarus from the dead, before he would ever solve Martha and Mary and their family's problems, he hurt with them by entering into their world and grieving with them. Wherever you're at today and whatever you're going through, I want to encourage you to allow your Savior to comfort you as only he can. That's truth number two. No pain can escape his embrace. Truth number three is tough. Tension is the best teacher. Now be careful here. Because many people, is fight or flight. It's a fight or flight situation. Many people right here, they want to run away from God when they should be running to God. I see it time and time again, sometimes many times throughout each month, when somebody finds themselves at a crossroads, there's a relational challenge, or there's a vocational challenge, or there's an academic challenge, or a friendship challenge, and instead of running to God, they run away from God. You know, in verse 6, it has, it's a confusing verse. The text specifically says that after Jesus got the news that Lazarus was sick and he was summoned by Martha and Mary to come and to heal him, he waited two days and his delay resulted in Lazarus' death. How do you make sense of that? How do you make sense of that? His intentional delay, intentional delay resulted in Lazarus' death. In verse 5, it tells us, Jesus loved, Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. He loved them. He did. There are going to be times in our lives where we're just simply not going to have a full manuscript. And we're not going to understand all the details. It's during those confusing times that we must assume, we must assume that God is working everything to our good 
and he has our best interest at heart. In this text, we see Jesus as Savior and Lord, and we're left with a decision. When we face, our, when we face a, a decision in life, and we come to a fork in the road, and it's confusing, we have to resolve during that moment to trust Him and to humbly obey Him and to resolve not to react emotionally, but rather to act humbly and obediently. It's true. Tension's a great teacher. Perhaps the best. But you can't run away from God in a moment of tension. You have to run to Him to learn the lessons. And remember, He's more concerned about developing your character than He is your comfort. You know, I've shared the story with you several times that I grew up without my dad. He got very sick when I was... Um, five years old, and about that time, maybe when I was six, he went to live as a permanent residence at the VA hospital um, nursing care center in Jackson when we lived in Columbus and Hattiesburg. He's paralyzed from the waist down, a very awkward thing for a little boy growing up when he went to his buddy's house to try to explain to his friend's parents when they ask you, well, what does your dad do for a living? Well, he used to work and he used to do this, but now he's disabled and paralyzed from the waist down. He's a resident at the VA. Heavy stuff for a 19-year-old kid. And I confess that when I was a kid, even a teenager, that I, I asked God, what's, why? Why don't you heal him? Why don't you give him his ability to walk again? God didn't answer that prayer the way I prayed. And so, you know, I wrestled with that a lot. And I guess I could have gone a number of directions in my faith. Uh, I actually threw myself into academics and athletics, more athletics at some point, And later I, academics came along. But I ended up walking toward God to try to figure that out and then God called me to be a pastor and for those of you who don't know for very young pastors and I'm not a young pastor anymore I'm not saying that but back in the day when I was a young pastor I always dreaded that phone call when somebody would call or somebody in the hospital or somebody had passed away how do you how do you handle that crisis I remember my first phone call and I remember driving to their home by myself. My mentor was nowhere around. It was just me and Jesus and the bereaved family. And I remember walking in, and they were broken hearted. The matriarch of the family had passed. It was my responsibility to plan the celebration of life service. I'd never only done that maybe one other time. That was with my dad's funeral. And I remember walking them through the process I remember specifically hurting with them and crying with them, showing compassion, showing mercy, being patient and listening and talking through that. And I remember when I got back to my office, I remember thinking to myself, Mark, what did you learn to do that? Because it wasn't in grad school. Then I'm like, oh, that's it. 20 plus years of watching doctors and nurses care for my dad. 20 plus years of helping my mom care for my dad when he would come home for a weekend visit. And then I began to understand how God was preparing me. I began to understand a little bit of the gifting that he gave me. You don't teach compassion, you model it. You don't teach mercy, you extend it. And I found myself extending compassion and extending mercy, and it was modeled to me. And I realized all those moments, two decades of tension, two decades of unanswered prayers, and when I sat with that first family who was grieving, I knew that all those years of tension were my best teacher. What are you running from today? I mean, really, what are you running from? Where have you just made a horrible mistake and you want to make it right? Where? where? Is it at work? Do you need to sit down and have a conversation with your boss? Is it your best friend? Maybe you need to go to your professor and say, look, I don't get it. Would you please help me know how to, to get the most out of this class? 
Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe you're like, I'm fixing to peace out on this deal. Well, if it was worth getting into, it's worth fighting for. If I can encourage you right now, just, for, just in this moment, stop running. Whatever you're running from. Because if you run today and you quit today, guess what? It's that much easier to quit tomorrow. Stay and learn the lessons that tension is trying to teach you. The lesson in the text, the glory of God was shown bright on Jesus as Savior and Lord. Well, what about what you're walking through right now? You know, with God, there's always more to the story. And it's incumbent upon me and it's incumbent upon you to live our lives as if we believe that God has our best interest at heart because he does. So whatever you're running from today, let me just encourage you, stop running and lean and trust. Lean into the trust that Jesus has given you and humbly obey him. Let's bring this home with two questions. Do you need to see it to believe it? Or will you finally let your faith work for you? I believe that many of you right now are letting your faith work for you. And then for still others, I believe you need help. And so for that help, I'm going to invite you to text next steps, one word, to 95577. We're waiting. We want to help you. And right now, this is my way of asking you to take action and let us know how we can help you. Maybe it's salvation. The Bible says everybody who calls in the name of the Lord shall be, not might be, shall be saved. That could be you today. Maybe you know Jesus and you've never been baptized. You've never been baptized. We want to help you with that. We want to celebrate that. Or maybe it's just a reset button. We have the resources to do that. Please let us know how we can better connect with you. Let's pray. Lord, you're good and you are great. And we are keenly aware there is no such thing as failing faith when it's connected to our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we not connect our faith to our circumstances, but to a risen Savior named Jesus. And you will take it from there. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Bird. With God, there's always more to the story. And we don't have to know what's next to do what's right. Let's close today by saying our commitment together. You will never suffer in my hands. I will never say nor do anything knowingly to hurt you. If you're down and I can lift you up, I'll do that. I will always, in every circumstance, seek to help and support you. If you need something and I have it, I'll give it to you. No matter what I find out about you, no matter what happens in the future, either good or bad, my commitment to you will never change. Thanks again for joining us today. Have a great week.